In the last video, I introduced vectors and pointed out that they serve as a basis for other types of data structures you'll encounter in R. We'll take a look at one of these, matrices, here. Matrices are two-dimensional objects consisting of rows and columns. In this respect, they're similar to data frames in R, which are another data structure that we'll cover separately in an upcoming video. As two-dimensional objects, you can think about both matrices and data frames as analogous to individual sheets in Microsoft Excel or an equivalent spreadsheet program, which are also arranged in rows and columns. One important difference in matrices and data frames in R, though, is that while a data frame can hold different types of data in its different columns, the data stored in a matrix all have to be of one specific type or class. For example, a matrix can store all numeric data or all character data, but it can't store a combination of both. That might sound familiar if you watched the previous video on vectors, as they have the same constraint. All of their data also have to be of the same class. This shared feature of vectors and matrices doesn't arise just by chance. Instead, a matrix in R is just a vector with dimension attributes added to it. Remember from the previous video that attributes of an object in R can be thought of as metadata for the object. In R, a matrix is simply a vector with a dimension attribute added to it that defines the numbers of rows and columns the vector gets arranged into. Here, I'll generate a vector I'll simply call x that contains the values 1 through 15. Viewing that new object, we see it's a simple one-dimensional vector similar to those we generated in the previous video on vectors. As we saw in that video, attributes assigned to an object can be accessed with the attributes function. In this simple case, no attributes have been assigned yet and null is returned. Now, let's add a dimension attribute to the vector. While the attributes function allows you to view attributes of an object, the attr function allows you to assign new attributes. One that can be assigned is dim, short for dimension. Here, we're assigning two dimensions, five rows and three columns as the dim attributes of x. If we now check the attributes again, we see the new dim attribute. Remember, all we've done is add the dim attribute, or again, you might think of this as a form of metadata, to the vector named x. If we check the class of this object, we see that R now views it as a matrix. We also get a different result when we view it. While it used to be a simple one-dimensional vector, the 15 values are now arranged into a matrix of five rows and three columns. What we just did, converting a vector into a matrix by adding the dimension attribute to the vector, is more frequently accomplished in the background when you use the matrix function, which allows you to construct a matrix in a way that might seem a little more intuitive. That function requires that you give it the set of values that will be used to construct the matrix, and then allows for additional arguments, such as the number of rows, number of columns, and direction in which the cells of the matrix will be populated with the values. Here, I'm using the matrix function to construct a new object, y, which we can see is the same as the matrix we previously created by adding the dimension attribute to the vector. I can also fill the cells in a row-wise pattern instead of the default column-wise pattern by adding the by row argument and setting it to true, which I've done here and assign the results to a third object, z. Notice that this time I still define the number of rows, but I drop the number of columns argument. By specifying that there have to be five rows, the only way to construct a matrix with 15 values and five rows is to have three columns, so defining both dimensions isn't necessary. We can view the two matrices we just created to see the effect of filling the cells by column, which is the default, and what we did for object Y on top, or by row, which we did for object Z on the bottom. To further drive home the relationship between vectors and matrices, let's revisit two aspects of vectors we spent some time on in the last video, vector recycling and indexing. We'll start with recycling. If we rerun the matrix function as we did originally, but we change the range of values from 1 to 15 to 1 to 10, we get a warning message that the data length is not a multiple of the number of columns. Notice I've named this object capital Y instead of the previous lowercase y. 
it's a good opportunity to point out that case does matter with object names. So these are stored as two separate objects. Like I mentioned in a previous video, since this is a warning message and not an error, R did run the code, even though it has some doubts that the result is what we intended. If we take a look at that new matrix, we see that the first two columns were filled with the values one through 10, and then R was out of values to fill the third column. And so it went back and reused or recycled the values one through five to fill the matrix. Let's also take a look at indexing a matrix. Because of its close relationship to a vector, a matrix in R can be thought of either in the context of having one dimension or two dimensions. Likewise, it can be indexed with either one or two dimensions. We use the square bracket notation to index a one-dimensional vector in the last video, and we can do the same thing here. Indexing the first eight elements of the matrix gives us the values one through eight, as they are pulled out in a column-wise manner. Indexing the matrix in two dimensions requires that both dimensions are specified in the square brackets. This is done by separating them with a comma in the order rows, comma, columns. So, I can pull out the value from the third row and second column with y square bracket three comma two, which returns eight. Alternatively, I can get the first three rows and first two columns with y square bracket one colon three comma one colon two. An important feature of indexing two dimensional objects in R is that if you leave one of the dimensions blank, everything will be returned. For example, if I want to get all of the values in column two, I can leave the rows dimension blank, which tells it to return all of the rows, and then just specify the second column. A couple of additional attributes that can be added to a matrix are column names and or row names. As with the dimensions, these can be added with the ATTR function by using the label dim names, but an easier and more widely used approach is to use the call names and or row names functions to assign them directly to the matrix. For example, here I'm giving the columns in Y the names A, B, and C by using a special vector named letters that is built into R that stores the capital letters in sequence. Indexing its first three elements gives A, B, and C. We could have equivalently given the vector A, B, and C by using the C or combine function that we've used previously. Viewing the object, we can see that these have been added as column headings. One final function I'll mention here that you'll probably find yourself using from time to time when working with matrices is the T function, which is short for transpose. Transposing a matrix simply flips the rows and columns, as I've done here with the matrix we've been working with. It's important to understand matrices in R, including their relationship with vectors. However, while you're almost sure to work with matrices at times, you'll likely find yourself working with data frames more often. In fact, you'll probably work with data frames in nearly every R session. We'll start to take a look at data frames, along with lists, which have direct relevance to data frames, in upcoming videos.